Сьогодні програма «Форум ТВ» в Українському культурному центрі «Олдміл» у Торонто, де буде відбуватися презентація книги історика професора Любомира Луцюка «Операція відплата». Є війна, і я знаю, що багато з нас є більше вважаються і інтересуються, що відбувається в Україні сьогодні, ніж ми є, можливо, в деяких історичних питань, які я буду детальнювати в наступні half hour і 40 хвилин. But in fact, the war that is being waged against Ukraine and Ukrainians today is at the same time also being waged against us. It's a genocidal war against the Ukrainian state and Ukrainians in Ukraine. And at the same time, it is a war intended to disrupt and dismember the Ukrainian diaspora. And this is what I will be talking about tonight. Now, my involvement with this began in 1985. I was a much younger man then. I had come back to Toronto from the University of Alberta where I finished my PhD. I had studied Ukrainian refugee immigration to Canada after the Second World War, the so-called DPs. So I was someone who had spent a few years analyzing and thinking about who these Ukrainians were who came to Canada after the Second World War, what their wartime experiences had been, what they had suffered, what they had seen, and why they came to Canada, the United States, England, and so on. I had no idea that when I came back to Toronto in 1985 that I would very soon become embroiled in a very difficult period for the Ukrainian-Canadian community, and indeed the Ukrainian diaspora as a whole, the debate over whether or not there were thousands of Nazi war criminals hiding in our community. Пане Луцюк, вітаємо вас сьогодні тут у Торонто, і сьогодні є презентація книги «Операція відплата». Звідки прийшла ідея і про що книга? Well, the idea for Operation Payback came from the KGB. Not from me. Um, it's a document that was generated in 1985 by the Ukrainian KGB in consultation with the KGB of the Soviet Union. And the purpose of the document of the campaign was to orchestrate tension between the Jewish and Ukrainian diasporas to break them apart uh, around the issue of alleged war criminals in North America. So the whole idea was to stoke discord between the Jewish and Ukrainian diasporas so that they would never get together and to do it by using this whole argument that there were thousands of Nazi war criminals hiding among the Ukrainian community of North America. Unfortunately, the government was not able to prove in a single case that there was a Nazi war criminal in Canada. And so, after several frustrating years, from their point of view, and from the point of view of those in the Jewish community who advocated that there were thousands hiding here, the government began <laughs> bending to pressure. And the government of Canada, unfortunately, from my point of view, took the line that they would follow the American pattern. And in the United States, the investigating agency, which was called the Office of Special Investigations, the OSI, didn't try to prove that someone was guilty of a war crime. They said, if you're in the United States and you now affirm that you were in Divizia or in Oltwun or Pa, then you must have lied to us when you came here and got your citizenship because we screened everyone perfectly. And if you're here, you shouldn't be here because we were screening people like you out back in 45, 46, 47, 48, 49. So if you're here, you must have lied. So they used the much less rigorous method of saying, we will denaturalize you and deport you if we think you lied about who you were when you came to the United States and therefore obtained your citizenship through misrepresentation. Well, I was involved with the Duchenne Commission as a young academic. So when I graduated from the University of Alberta in 1984 and I came back to Toronto to do postdoctoral studies at the University of Toronto, um, I was uh, involved with the Civil Liberties Commission, which became later the Ukrainian Canadian Civil Liberties Association under John Gregorovich. And that group was constituted to defend the community's good name against these allegations that we were hiding Nazis in our midst. So. 
I began this work, if you like, in 1984-85, and it's been something that uh, I've never lost sight of. But what makes it fascinating is that we always thought, we suspected that the KGB were behind this, but we couldn't prove it. Now we have Chorn and Nabila, black on white, evidence that the KGB orchestrated the whole thing, created these arguments and this tension that exists to this day. And you see it when people desecrate uh, Ukrainian monuments in Edmonton or in Oakville or in Toronto, they attack businesses or Putin himself. I mean, remember that on the 24th of February when Putin announced his special military operation, what did he say he was going to do? He was coming to Ukraine to get rid of the Bandarivci. That's what he actually said, Bandarivci. Not Nazis, not extremists, not you know patriots. So this whole mentality, this Soviet mentality, you might think disappeared in you know, 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. But in fact, it still persists. It's still relevant. It's a way in which the Ukrainian diaspora is still being weakened uh, by these allegations. If you ask the average Canadian, were there Nazis in Canada after World War II? Did they hide here? The answer will almost always be yes. And that's because the KGB planted that story and they brag about it, by the way. The, the, this isn't kind of a vague statement. They say, we planted stories in the Toronto Star. They say it right there. They say we planted uh, bulletins and uh, am, uh, pamphlets and things around the United States. And we created the Office of Special Investigations in the U.S. to investigate Nazi war criminals. And we were so successful in the United States that we did it in Canada. And we got the Dishan Commission. So, you know, you can't have it any, any clearer than that. So my, my role as an academic was to um, take this document and incorporate it into a larger book, which includes many articles that I wrote about this issue over the years, put it together with the findings of the Duchenne Commission and other documents to put it all in one place. And people say to me, well, Oh, well, I can get it on the internet. The answer is you can't. Even articles that I wrote in Canadian newspapers like the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, are not easily found. So this gives someone who's interested in the subject all of the information in one book. As we in the West have dealt with um, the war, we've also had to deal with another thing. We started with there are Nazis in Canada and the United States, we should bring them to justice. Then we denaturalize and deport them. By the way, they never deported or denaturalized anybody because the evidence wasn't there. So now we've moved to another stage. The Nazis are, the Nazis are all dead, pretty much. Um, we couldn't take them to criminal court, too expensive, too long. Couldn't take them to denaturalize and deportation because it didn't work. So now it's a memory war. Now the war is about not you or your generation or mine, it's about our children. It's about telling our children and our grandchildren that their grandparents or parents collaborated with the Nazis, were Nazis. That we have put up monuments honoring Bandera or Shukhevich or the Divizia. This is because we have a, a Nazi agenda. And thanks to the support of the Ukrainian Research Institute, the Temerte Foundation, UNO Foundation, many different Ukrainian Canadian groups, Canada Ukraine Foundation, we've been able to actually distribute this book around the world. So the record of what was true and what really happened will be there for a long time yet. And I think that's the greatest accomplishment of the book. Well, I think the thing is, th there's, two, there's two people, uh, or two groups. One is our youth. It's in English. And many students will go to university or will associate with Canadians, like normal, perfectly normal, and will hear that, you know, your grandfather was in that Ukrainian Galician division. He was a Nazi, a sympathizer with the Nazis. Or your grandfather was in a Ulm or Pa. Your grandmother helped support a Ulm. They were all fascists. Well, that's not true. So I think for that next generation, which did not have to go through the Duchenne Commission, did not suffer, that was a very unpleasant time, I must tell you. Um, they didn't have to go through that, but they should learn about it. And of course, those of us who were there, it brings back memories of struggle against uh, of some very uh, competent people, uh, people who were 
committed to their cause. I mean, the Jewish community did the right thing. They said, my God, there are Nazis in Canada. We should get rid of them. I completely agree. My mother was a slave laborer. I, I have no, no, no reason to support Nazis. Uh, she suffered because of them. So from my point of view, um, hopefully the Jewish community will read this and say, we got conned. Now, this doesn't mean that there weren't some bad Ukrainians in World War II. Of course there were. There were some bad Jews in World War II, too. People did all sorts of things during the war to survive, or out of fear, or out of greed, or out of prejudice. But in the main, what the KGB did was they took those few bad apples and they made it into a big uh, campaign to sort of split Jews and Ukrainians in the diaspora. And we all know the Jewish community is hardworking, very influential earned its place in society by hard work. Ukrainians, perhaps a little less so, but there are more of us. And so they took these two constituencies and they put, put them into a fight. And everybody knows that, those, that that fight continues, right? And so the young generation of Jewish Canadians are raised to believe that, you know, those Ukrainians, they're not, maybe not the boy and girl you're playing with at school, but their grandparents were bad people. The poison that the KGB inserted into the body politic of North America has had consequences now for half a century. Ask your neighbor tomorrow or next day, do you think that there were Nazis in Canada after the Second World War that maybe hid in the Ukrainian community? I, I bet you every one of you will, will get a yes. Right? Um, people who know me Stick, stay away from me if I come near them and try to ask them that question but because uh, they know I'll start jumping on them but the reality of it is most of our fellow Canadians would say yes and they might say but that's in the past it's all gone you know we're, we're standing with Ukraine and all that but there's that lingering doubt so the Soviets give them credit my, my afterword in the book is called give the devil his due they were brilliant they were brilliant they took these long-standing prejudices and stereotypes, they stoked them, they disrupted the beginnings of what was going to be some collaboration between Jews and Ukrainians and the diaspora around human rights issues, the dissidents and so on, the refuseniks. People were starting to work together in Ukraine and here, and the Soviets were alarmed about that, and so they used the World War II war crimes thing to break us up, and you don't have to believe Luba Berluchuk, because we got it in writing. Ви з Володимиром В'ятровичем також написали, і зараз вже видається книжка про що вона. Ah, there's a new book coming out with Volodymyr Vyatrovich called Enemy Archives, and it is a collection of Soviet documents that they captured before, during, and after the Second World War, dealing with OUN and UPA. So we collected these inform this um, documentary evidence in the Soviet archives about the nationalist movement. We've translated with the help of Marta Olinik from Montreal uh, over 1,000 pages and it's coming out as a major book through Miguel Queen's Press in February, March of the coming year. Um, it's a remarkable insight into who the people who joined OUN and UPA were, what was their ideology, what did they hope for, what did they achieve, and of course the very fact that the Soviets were still fighting them for almost 15 years tells you how strong they were. Um, more importantly, I think, is this presents an accurate and fair and complete uh, account of who OUN and UPA were as nationalists. And that's something I think we are sadly lacking because there's been all sorts of, you know, decades of Soviet propaganda, including this Operation Payback stuff, decades of propaganda trying to convince Ukrainians and the rest of the world that Ukrainian nationalism was evil. And it wasn't. It was the struggle of a nation to achieve statehood. And they fought against anyone who came to Ukrainian land and said, we'll be here now, we'll take your land. They fought the Poles, they fought the Germans, they fought the Soviets, the Romanians, the Hungarians, and all sorts of others. Well, what's wrong with that? If someone breaks into my home, I'm going to fight or give up. There's a, you have two choices, or sur you know, surrender or fight. So they fought, and it's perfectly normal. Nowhere do, have I found evidence that Ukrainians attacked another country and said, we'll take a little piece of your country. And of course, this is happening right now. Ukrainians are saying, just leave, go away. We're not, we're not interested in occupying part of Russia. Even Kuban, which you could argue was part of Ukraine at one time, Ukrainians aren't saying, we'll take Kuban back. They're saying, what we had in 1991 is what we should have 
in 2022. That's it. Everybody agreed the borders would stay. Okay, w what are you doing here? And the same thing, Ukrainians in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s were fighting for what? For an independent, sovereign Ukrainian state, period. What is wrong with that? How is that different from what the Italians wanted, or what the South Africans wanted, or what the Japanese wanted, or the Israelis wanted? You know, we want a state of our own. We want a Jewish state. Why? Well, because we feel safe there. This is our home. Okay, I agree. Fine. Same thing happens with the Palestinians. Everyone wants that. So why should Ukrainians want anything less? So what we suspected turned out to be true. And the only thing, although I don't think this will change in my lifetime for whatever time I still have left on earth, I'm not sure it'll change in the, in the time, you know, that God grants my daughter on earth. It, it, the poison was planted pretty deep. But the only thing we can try to do is what the good book tells us to do. And that is when you think back to it, to John, the truth will set us free. So I hope with this book, I've given you the truth. Thank you very much. Для програми Форум ТВ з Торонто Костянтин Сніцер та Лариса Баюс.